Okay, so uh, good morning, everyone. And welcome to day two of uh, our summer and training school. Um, today, uh, we are going to discuss this topic, who's big data for governing human mobility through technology. And our morning session uh, will now begin uh, with uh, Professor Rocco Bellanova. Uh, he's a research professor at the uh, Vraje Universität from, from Brussels, interdisciplinary research group, law, science, technology, and society. Uh, Rocco is the principal investigator of the ERC starting grant project Data Union, the European Data Union, European security integration through database interoper interoperability. He's co-editor of Big Data and Society and a member of the editorial board of Technoscienza Italian Journal of Science and Technology Studies. His research and work sits at the intersection of politics, law, science, and technology studies. And Rocco studies also how digital data become pivotal elements in the governing of societies. And also he focuses on European security practices and the role of data protection. Um, Rocco's presentation today uh, is about securitization of human mobility in the area of digital borders. Rocco, thank you very much for being with us. Thank you very much for your participation and the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, first of all, uh, my apology for not being uh, there with you. I would have uh, very much preferred to be uh, there and enjoy the sun and uh, your company, but a uh, professional and personal reason oblige me to intervene directly from Belgium uh, remotely. So uh, during the presentation, I will try to find some ways to intervene a little bit more with you, but please uh, don't make it boring. Like, uh, and uh, I reverse the, the, um, the responsibility on you to some extent. So do not hesitate to, to uh, raise your hand or just to intervene, open your mic and ask questions or comment uh, as much as possible. Uh, thank you for the presentation um, and the introduction. I am indeed a research professor at the Free University in Brussels, at the Flemish uh, University. Before that, I was um, an assistant professor of critical data studies uh, in the media studies department at the University of Amsterdam. And previously, I worked both in Amsterdam, Brussels, and Oslo, um, always in the domain of uh, security studies. and. Uh, taking a critical approach to security studies, especially security practice in Europe. Um, I know that uh, yesterday you had another class with uh, Matthias Liese, uh, my colleague and, and dear friend. So I believe that many of the topics that I will touch upon are not going to be completely unfamiliar to you. Uh, there may be some repetition or some complementary angles. And uh, I hope this will feed into um, a more multifaceted approach to uh, our topic. Um, also an important uh, clarification, I'm not a, a migration specialist. Again, I'm uh, somebody that works more on uh, security practices in Europe and the role that technology and data protection have acquired through the years. And I move from a conceptual background that is uh, familiar to some extent to European Union studies but is increasingly informed by so-called science technology studies. And I don't know how many of you have ever heard about science technology studies. Can you raise your hand or make sound about that? Okay, there, there are a few. Good, wonderful. Um, I have a slightly different title, as always it happens. And so the new title is on database infrastructural fragility and algorithmic power in European security. And the idea is to try to walk you through a series of uh, uh, research and um, um, introductory, to some extent, uh, um, insight uh, that have been uh, brought together uh, through work with a couple of colleagues and notably with a colleague working in the University of Trento, Georgios Glovtius, uh, with whom we have published a couple of articles recently focusing more on database maintenance and fragility. So some of these themes are going to traverse my presentation. And I will also try to, 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 to kick in some of the things that interest me uh, right now. And I will try to 
show you why you should be interested too. Uh, I'm trying to sell my argument about the importance to focus on something that we tend to forget or to oversee when we think about European security, but also uh, European uh, governance of uh, migration and uh, um, and the borders. And I have a, a little baby uh, next to me that may intervene and interrupt us. Uh, welcome him. Um, uh, Sorry uh, for that, but not so sorry. It's uh, normal that uh, this is the case. Um, okay. <clears throat> so, uh, why I believe it is important to 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 work on uh, on database when we talk about uh, the European Union and uh, um, European security. Yes. Um, first of all, because in fact. Uh, Database are the other facet of something that we tend to take now for granted. This was not really the case uh, around 10 years ago, which is uh, one of the most powerful tools right now from a European Union perspective in the world stage, which is data protection. Uh, you may be familiar with it. Uh, I've encountered it in different forms. I've studied the data protection legislation or have to field forms uh, linked to data protection regulation, the so-called GDPR. Uh, in, in our field, we call um, we have a different set of legislation. But what I want to say is that uh, data protection, which is something that is so commonplace in our everyday, to some extent has been twinned in the European Union to the raise of digital database. And so you, you may know or not know one of the most famous cases, which is the French case of the so-called Safari system, which was an initiative to interconnect existing repository, data repository and um, uh, database uh, set up by the French administration in uh, the late 60s and uh, 70s. And uh, this uh, idea of interconnection was met with a lot of resistance after uh, Le Monde, uh, the newspaper brokered the news about this uh, initiative. And uh, there was a sense back then that uh, the raise of a digital database or so repositories that were able to contain large amount of information about the population were something that was uh, outstretching the power of the state. Um, you should not be too much surprised because uh, um, you may have heard or know that uh, existing repository back then, uh, a paper repository and archives uh, rather than digital ones, which emerged only later, um, were very much used during the Second World War, for example, to identify um, the person and the population that were to be targeted, notably by uh, Nazis. Uh, and so, uh, for example, um, uh, a census record in uh, the Netherlands or in Norway were blown up by a resistance group during the Second World War to avoid um, um, and Nazi occupiers to get uh, a grasp on those information and to more easily identify people. Uh, there's all the debate that was um, uh, revamped uh, during the um, uh, post 9-11 period when the biometric identifier has been uh, represented again by several governments and uh, private companies as a solution of identification. There was a lot of resistance uh, uh, because uh, it was uh, very much recalling a way of uh, um, filing people, uh, identifying people through, through a way that was expected to connect them to their identity and so to have information about their religion, for example, their behavior, political behavior, and so on and so forth. So all these kind of activities of, uh, of uh, controlling the population through a series of information have always been met with some resistance as a crucial moment of statecraft and uh, also of uh, potential abuse of power. So data protection is partially also a reaction to this rise of a digital database. And so when we think about data protection now, we tend to think about other digital practices, but it's uh, worth to remember that uh, one of the most important practice was the establishment itself of database or the possibility to interconnect these uh, repositories. But uh, when we come more uh, closer to, to what we can call now the area of freedom, security, and justice, I assume that you are all um, familiar with that. Uh, we can see something very peculiar happening uh, that also, again, we tend to forget, and is the fact that indeed, uh, 
database and uh, what we call EU large scale database are a real important element of the skeleton of zero freedom, security, and justice. I've been teaching a course on zero freedom, security, and justice through several years, and it's always difficult to um, re collect the story of the area freedom, security, and justice. We can do it through a focus on the main uh, treaties and the emergence of what we what was called before the third pillar of justice and affairs, then its absorption. And so we can do it through a, a focus on legislative milestone. We can do as part of the uh, sociological approach uh, to some extent I've uh, been doing to zero freedom, security, and justice through an analysis of how uh, cooperation across uh, professionals and uh, not only the high level politician, but also like a uh, representative from interior ministries uh, or justice ministries and the middle management to some extent start to meet. And it is all the words that focus on a genealogy of their freedom, security and justice, focusing on on uh, Trevi, for example, and other kind of initiatives that put together, expert together. So the creation of sort of epistemic community with people that uh, believe that the world is uh, now threatened by a flux of people, goods, uh, resources, and so on. Or we can supplement this kind of uh, um, uh, historical reading of the construction of their freedom, security, and justice by focusing also on a series of techniques that are uh, been developed and one of those techniques is indeed the establishment of a large-scale information system so we always think about schengen as a compensatory measure i believe that uh, many of you are familiar with that but remember uh, <clears throat> that uh, uh, schengen is nothing without the schengen information system Okay, and, and we tend to forget about that uh, because we do not encounter the Schengen information system so often, many of us at least, I believe, in our everyday life. In fact, uh, it, it may be way more common than we expect. Uh, uh, um, uh, as a friend of mine put it, I'm, uh, I have the privilege uh, of being a white male dude, so uh, my encounter with police are quite random. Uh, the last time I was... Um, back in Amsterdam on the wrong lane. Huh? So this was the last encounter that I had with the police, but still it turned into an encounter with the Schengen information system too, huh? like because uh, they wanted to double check whether I had the right documents and they discovered that I indeed I had lost uh, one ID a few years earlier and that this was already signaled and so on and so forth. Okay, and again, I'm a privileged one if you see what I mean in terms of encounters. So in reality, it's way more present in our everyday life or the everyday life of, um, of uh, some of us more present than others. But still, what I want to say is that uh, the Schengen information system is a, is a real pillar and is not the only one. We can see that um, the area of freedom, security and justice is uh, a kind of uh, what we call the scattered landscape uh, in the sense that there are large scale system. Think about Eurodac, think about the visa information systems that have been already established and are running. Other systems that are being adopted uh, on paper, but they are still in the build up, like the entry exit system and the European travel information authorization system, so called ETIAS system. If you have gone to the States or to Canada, you may have had to feel. Uh, a similar kind of online form to provide uh, in advance your travel information so that uh, um, US or Canadian authorities may, can make a decision of pre-authorization about your travel, which does not grant you entry, but uh, already like establish or push the border a bit further. And uh, we have other systems that are not per se large scale data system database system, but that have organized a scattered gain landscape of uh, national systems that are expected to be connected. And here I'm thinking notably about the so-called PRUM database. Do you know a little bit about the PRUM database? Those are national systems that are expected to not only collect uh, biometric fingerprints and um, other personal information, but also DNA information. So the PRUM initiative uh, 
15 years ago um, were something that allowed all member states authorities to build up their own national database for DNA. Uh, with uh, member states like Italy, notably, that only had ad hoc DNA repository, but that were allowed then to build a national DNA system. And the idea is those national DNA system are going to be connected to a specific uh, IT system that allow to double check whether the um, um, a, a digital reading of this DNA uh, information is uh, available in other system or not through a hidden system. So they will send the information without a name attached or other personal information attached. And if there is a match, a request for further information can happen. You see, so there is always like what uh, I found interesting of the Prum uh, uh, case is that is about very, very sensitive data because DNA data are by itself uh, information that are extremely sensitive. Uh, uh, we, we know that uh, with the DNA research um, so fast, um, fast tracked, uh, what now seems a pseudonymized uh, DNA profile may not be the case in 10 years uh, when the research advances. So it's possible that this repository will actually contain very, very sensitive information about your health and other uh, aspects. And uh, the idea is that uh, when you set up this kind of system at European level, you are also acting on the national level by either empowering or allowing the creation of a national system that may not be present in advance. Right? This is always a trick with the um, policy making in the area of freedom, security, justice, and in other policy domain across the EU is the fact that uh, through harmonization, often uh, you create the condition of possibility or building up something that was not already there. And the other ones that we'll be talking a bit more in the second part of the um, uh, lecture is the passenger name record uh, database that again, uh, in this case, foreseen the uh, um, collection of uh, passenger information provided by commercial actors, uh, but that arrive at a national uh, database, let's say, a national authority, and then can be put in circulation across Europe. Uh, so, so we have different kind of European database. Uh, European database means different things. Uh, in the first two ballot points is uh, systems that are managed at the central level with the national implementation too. In the third ballot point is national system that are Europeanized to some extent, because there is a technical system that allows the circulation across Europe of information. In a, in a recent paper, and I think that is it's still worth to focus a little bit on the Schengen information system, we, we dig a little bit on what we call the, um, like uh, the, the fragility maintenance of, uh, of this system. And why so? Uh, first of all, because the Schengen information system is the oldest and the most consulted database across the EU. And it's like the figures, when you look at them, is quite impressive. Eh? We're talking about millions of uh, data stored and millions of consultation per year. So it's something that is actually used. Eh? It's not something up there and once in a while. It's like very frequently, very often used by a lot of police officers, one way or the other. It's also very specific because when we talk about digital database in Europe, we tend to think that uh, they are either on third country nationals or that they are only about people. And in fact, uh, the Schengen information system contains what they call alerts. Huh? So like uh, there's supposed to be a reason for, uh, for, um, for this information to be stored there, but they can be about third country national indeed, but also about EU citizen. Uh, think about those that have been um, suspected of being the foreign fighters, so-called returning foreign fighters, or connected to case of terrorism and criminality, organized criminality but also about objects. In, in fact, I, I think that quite the majority of the information stored in the Schengen information system is about objects uh, that have to be followed, that have been um, stolen and, and that have to be put to the attention of other authorities. It's also particularly interesting because uh, through its evolution, it started from containing alphanumerical data, like uh, information that you you 
click in, huh? like a, a first name, Rocco, a second family name, Bellanova, to also other kind of uh, digital asset, not asset, right? that are biometrics, uh, photos, and so on. So it's a fairly complex system indeed to, to keep up. And uh, it's also quite interesting that uh, in the reviews of this system, given just the magnitude of, uh, of, uh, of the information that is stored in the system, there's a lot of stuff that is uh, trash, uh, that is not very accurate, that has been um, wrongly uh, stored there or stored in the wrong repository. Yeah? Like, uh, the case I always tend to use is the fact that uh, like uh, there, there has been some uh, um, rumors in the news that after the Paris attack, uh, now eight years ago, um, one of the main suspect was uh, stopped uh, while he was in a car and it was checked uh, by the French police before the border with Belgium. And actually this person was listed in the Schengen information system, but it, this person was also listening in the wrong file. And so in a moment of stress and uh, pursuit of uh, the people that had just uh, um, carried out the massacre and the attacks, this person was not stopped and retained. It was just stopped and let go. Uh, and so this tells you so much how a small glitch or a small error of data input or in the wrong category, for example, may have huge consequences. Uh, it took most to apprehend the same person uh, and, and it was quite of a um, yeah uh, challenging things for law enforcement authorities uh, in Belgium notably. The other important element of the Schengen information system is that uh, being so old and having gone through so many important steps of European integration <clears throat> it has had a quite bumpy and dynamic political life. Uh, it's not something that has uh, been created once for all and then forgotten about, or it works, but those systems uh, have a life, a political life of their own. Uh, at some point after the, the huge push for enlargement, uh, some member state, I'm thinking about Romania and uh, Bulgaria among others, were not allowed to, to completely join the Schengen space because among other things that the Schengen information system was not up to the task of being open up to their um, IT system. So it required a series of adjustment of major adjustment to make it possible to contain more information to have the right connection and so on and so forth. So at some point uh, the database, uh, there's a literature you may have been became familiar or heard about that was focusing very much about the securitization of Europe through digital means. So the idea that we were moving to a digital fortress Europe. Uh, what is interesting is that we tend to think about that in terms of external borders. So we tend to think about uh, uh, a form of uh, of um, uh, rebordering towards so-called third countries, but the database and their dysfunctioning or their specific IT challenges may become a form of internal borrowing within the EU. And they're not being able to absorb further information or to be open up to further national authorities became a factor of European differentiation within the so-called borders of Europe, okay? So it's an interesting point of view on the different forms of rebordering you know, that uh, European institutions are building up or actually to some extent uh, have to, to, to undergo themselves uh, when uh, we think about that. So um, my insistence on the Schengen information system is really to, to give you an idea of saying like, listen, there is something that seems so mundane so remotely so apolitical so boring and still has so many consequences it's so present in our everyday life <clears throat> but uh, at some point uh, there, there has been uh, a kind of a, a split between uh, between a european literature uh, scholarly attention to to what we can uh, call or think about uh, the securitization of the European Union, but also uh, more in general, like the, the progress of uh, European Union integration in the sector of, uh, or in the domain of Justin Affairs. Um, 
that that uh, we had forgotten that for for European institutions themselves, database became quite important. Uh, when when we look back to the last 10, 15 years, and even more, I will like we get close now to the 20 years um, of uh, of retrospect. To some extent, we can see that. Uh, all those idea about the establishment of what we call now a security union are premised to some extent on the buildup of what I call a data union. On the fact that, yes, we have the Schengen information system, now the Schengen information system too, we have Eurodoc, we have the visa information system, we had a huge debate about the possibility of law enforcement authority to get access to this database, uh, which was very problematic. Think about all the legal and also political implication of uh, uh, providing access to something like Eurodac, which is a database for asylum seeker, to law enforcement authorities. So, like a, a phagocitation to some extent of a migration and asylum management by law enforcement and uh, security. So, this idea that uh, people that are asking for an asylum for asylum or people that have been registered and asking for a visa may be suspicious by themselves. Uh, I'm thinking here about the works of Katia Franco, as that speaks about the crime migrants. Uh, so the idea that uh, immigrants by themselves start to be seen as potential suspects, potential criminals. So this uh, slippery slope and that is substantiated by this uh, request by law enforcement authorities to get access to databases that were established for a different purpose. Right? So kind of a primote of law enforcement over other um, policy field or, or, or policy activities. So police over policy to some extent, if you want to rephrase that way. The further step, the first uh, um, path was to say, okay, it's not enough to have this. This is too scattered. We need to create a system where all these databases are available at the same time. Because what happens uh, in the practice, uh, if you enter, um, for example, many offices, so you will see that the data protection system that the US put into place as a key principle that is purpose limitation. So the idea that uh, when you establish a database, you have to set up in advance, what is the purpose of that database? If you do it for visa purpose, that is the main reason. All the data have to be collected in a proportional manner in order to accomplish that kind of policy. So they can only be used for that reason and purpose and exception are to be considered the exception, a case by case exception. And here we have a shift and the idea to say like, okay, yeah, whatever the purpose, they have to be available. So instead of having several screen and several computers with several access right, the same police officer or border officer should be able to browse across a different database. And here you may have heard this uh, late motif of uh, the possibility to connect the dots. Uh, after 9-11, one of the main uh, input of the um, uh, commission up out 9-11 uh, in the US and the report was to say that uh, uh, public authority were lacking imagination. But uh, the interesting part of that imagination is that they were saying, listen, in fact, all these uh, people that participated in the terrorist attack we had some information about them, but uh, we were like the kids that uh, have to do this uh, game of connecting the different dots on a on a on a on a piece of paper so that the figure emerge. But we were not able to do that, so we had no imagination. So we were not being able to use the data that we already had. We didn't optimize what we already had, and this brings to this wet dream of interoperability. I will be talking. Uh, right now, um, that is the idea to say like uh, we have a lot of data out there and we have to make sure that uh, we access all this data, that there is no legal or technical reason why we cannot identify that Rocco, which was also in that database and in that database ultimately is the main suspect because of that. Uh, is this idea to move to some extent towards kind of a uh, interface like Google that allows you to browse the internet at once. Uh, we can have a long conversation whether Google 
allows you to get all the internet, uh, all the BS that Google would search include. Uh, you may have heard about the works uh, focusing on, on the kind of uh, BS that Google search result uh, brings you back or, or spit you back. Uh, and we can do a lot of analogies with even in case of we accomplishing uh, interoperability, what kind of BS will uh, uh, pop up. But there is this idea that we need to have what we call interoperability. Okay, and this is an idea that comes actually before the 2010s. It has been already tabled by the Commission in 2005, 2006, and was met with a lot of resistance. So the idea to, to go beyond this principle of purpose limitation so that we can browse across the existing database, maximizing that. In, in the field, more focusing on, on the border surveillance, uh, we have been working with an old colleague of mine, Denis Duet. Um, for example, the, the idea behind Eurosur to some extent was to create this a system of system uh, to maximize the fact that uh, there are some uh, monitoring system already there. We have to create other ones, but ultimately what matters is not each individual system, but the possibility to go across all this system. And I still remember that uh, back then the commission was presenting that as a sort of form of um, or vac, we had this idea that we have not to have a blank spot. That everything, all the reality, all the world has to be turned into a digital reality, rich in information that will allow us to operate on that. Okay? And this is quite important because, and, and here is my STS, Critical Data Studies input for, for you. We tend to think about data and database uh, as they are a straightforward representation of the world out there. Okay, that's what the, you, you may be aware with this idea of a pyramid that, where there is the word on the bottom, then there are the data that are a translation of the word into information, uh, like a bridge between the word and information. So like a factual data, then there is information, what we gather out of the data, which will bring us knowledge and at the top of the pyramid, uh, wisdom. And so the possibility to, um, to have something like uh, uh, more information about the world and so the possibility to, to, to have knowledge uh, so that we exert power on the world is premised on the fact that we have a lot of data. Ah, the dream to some extent of big data is that, uh, is this turning the world into data and uh, the specificity of big data was the fact to some extent similar to what we are discussing here is to say, in fact, uh, given that we have been data fine, uh, uh, datafication process has been active since several years and uh, uh, dozen of years, if not, uh, again, think about the Schengen information system. And the fact that it is not uh, something that was built up yesterday, but a few years earlier, several years earlier. So we already have a wealth of data. And these data are built up in very different ways. So we want to have this data all together because uh, by bringing those data together, we can extract a further form of knowledge that was missing if we're focusing on data one after the other. Okay, this is uh, the main <clears throat> rhetoric and discourse behind big data to some extent. And obviously to do so, we need to do it with uh, computing power. We have to do it at speed because uh, we have to browse across a lot of data um, very fast and so on and so forth. I see that there is uh, Anna that has a uh, raised hand, please. Yes, thank you, thank you. I just have a question uh, because you said um, when you were talking about the purpose of limitation, and then interoperability. So my question is, so how can you actually reconcile both if, uh, I mean, th that's your point now that it's basically impossible to, because if a regulation has a purpose, th that's the purpose limitation. But then if through interoperability, you extend the use of this database, it's basically contradicting the principle. Uh... Great question. And uh, I invite you to ask the same question to uh, Niovi, uh, who is also going to, to present, uh, Professor of Uvala, uh, who is a maximum expert on database interoperability from a, a law perspective, uh, a, a, an amazing scholar. And, and I'm sure that she has a strong opinion <laughs> about that, knowing her work uh, um, and having heard her 
uh, speaking not uh, not uh, not so uh, long ago uh, yes this has been the main uh, um, the main uh, attention uh, the european data protection supervisor uh, you may know um, uh, about this institution it's a very powerful institution in fact uh, in europe has spoken about uh, um, interoperability as the point of no return uh, that there is a before and after of data protection in fact uh, after we start to take seriously interoperability and in fact this is trick still the legislator as some of my colleagues uh, call it um, has voted in favor of interoperability. So, so this is a legal reality we have to deal so far, uh, unless somebody will bring it down in front of the Court of Justice, but uh, we'll see about that also in a second. So uh, the, the question is how to reconcile it. And uh, so far, most of the proposals are of a uh, technical nature. And uh, I can maybe advance a little bit more and for example one initiative that is not called by itself as interoperability but i will invite you to consider it through a perspective of interoperability or through the problematic of interoperability is the reform of the europol um, legal framework uh, the europol regulation not the latest one but the previous one the one of 2016 which is the most encompassing one um, and one of the key element of uh, this regulation is the fact that for the first time, the Europol legal framework, uh, so the Europol regulation, because before it was not a regulation, does not say a word about how the information system of Europol have to be set up. And this, compared to the fact that the previous legislative framework were very attentive to establish an IT landscape within Europol in which all Europol um, data have to be organized in silos. Uh, and so you do not have only one database, but multiple database. This possibility of uh, moving outside the silo approach from the facto is an interoperability one because that has been received by Europol authorities uh, and the different boards as a green light to build up what they call uh, integrated data management principle. That is an idea that all this data have to be moved out of silos in what they call a data lake, uh, which is very US talk uh, and, uh, and jargon. And this, this idea that uh, if before data were swimming into small ball, uh, if you want to use this metaphor of fishes, now they can go into a lake, so they will mix. And so the borders around this data that were previously guaranteed by the fact that each silos had a purpose and this purpose was limiting their use and their access and their processing function. Now the border is directly attached to the data set and no more to the group, to the database. So there is a shift from the database to the data set. And so each data set, uh, which I, I believe is quite difficult to identify it, so it will require a wonderful PhD uh, research by itself, comes with certain rules that are expected to be inscribed through metadata that allow the, its processing or its uh, absorption into processing operation. Okay, so it's no more the fact that let's say all information about, uh, I'm, I'm making this up uh, uh, just for the purpose of conversation, uh, is no more that uh, information that we have gathered at the odd spot uh, will only be used for the purpose of um, anti-smuggling, but is that uh, some of the information maybe that we have been uh, gathered during our work as a hotspot will be used also for counterterrorism, also for uh, the fight against organized crime in that specific case, in that specific case, or not in this case. Okay, so all data set comes with strings attached in theory. Okay, and, and it will be very interesting to see how often uh, this turns into more strings attached than before or less strings attached than before and so on and so forth and how much the system, the overall system can move to that data lake functioning. This is not something very easy. Eh? If you want to, to, to think about a more 
closer to you, maybe case uh, when you think about what we have experienced through the pandemic. Uh, so information about our health, uh, think about all the debates that accompanied the proposal to have a, a company like Palantir to data integrate information stored by the UK national health system. Okay, health service. And, and wh why it was so controversial is because Palantir is one of the main company that uh, operates by integrating data or the fact of uh, building the, the, the technical uh, structures that allow for what we call interoperability. Uh, so by reproducing data at a higher layer so that they can be browsed uh, by a new system. But all of this is extremely delicate and extremely difficult to implement. So, so between the, the goal of saying, let's create a data lake and let's actually build up a data lake that respect that protection principle and still fits for purpose or for the new um, ambitions of law enforcement authorities, that's very difficult. Huh? And, and we are lacking a research on that. Uh, partially the purpose of our ERC project is to focus way more on about implementation. So how all this promise to reconcile uh, purpose limitation, data protection, and the ambition of data uh, practitioners and data analysts is uh, yeah, the main empirical focus of our research is going to be. How do you do in practice? Okay. But yeah, to, 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 to connect back one more second about the overall topic of uh, the big data, interoperability is very interesting because uh, it really focuses on this idea that the big data is not only about collecting more data from the world, but is to accept, and this is the most problematic element I will say, I will dare to say about big data, that there already exists a digitalized world, a datafied world. And that we have to harvest the existing data and to use it to generate information and knowledge that will allow us to act upon the real world. And, and, and this tends us to make us forget two important steps. First of all, that the way in which we turn the world into a datafy reality, it's always a matter of choices and instruments and so it's never to be considered straightforward the representation of the world there is always an excess in the world there is amazing work that has been carried out by the uh, research team of a, of a project that is uh, now finishing at the university of bologna about uh, how um, and that analysts start to enroll people in hotspot uh, and, and they have carried out a comparison of the different possibilities that you have to characterize somebody in front of you. And it's, you know, like when you right click or, or you have to have uh, the window with a different option about who you are, uh, Mr. Mrs. Uh, doctor, professor, or X or non-binary and so on. All, all of this is an ontological view on you. And different authorities have different possibility. Are you married, divorced, widow? Are you cohabitant legal? Are you in a pact? Are you in a in a different form? And not all authorities will recognize the same kind of link between people, for example. And so some authorities will accept the fact that even if you do not have a formal marriage, but a different kind of uh, uh, legal inscription as a, as a family, like you know, like the, the fact that uh, there is a possibility for this to be digitalized or not, understood as the datafication of your world of your reality, make a lot of difference. Okay, some right can um, fall apart or not. I, I'm, I do not want to make the the connection with what is happening in Italy with regard to the registration of kids from homoparental families and so on, but it's not so far eh, to some extent. If this cannot be inscribed, if they cannot be datafied, this has a cascade effect on the future. So you have the first problem that not all the world has been digitized in the same way. And then, and if you fail to understand, so you're already failing to see that uh, different IT systems are not seeing the world in the same way. And the second point is that if you only focus on this data as the re actual reality and you try to act back, you will have sort of a, a lot of bias that you have to deal with, okay? 
and uh, I come back now to, to the example I was given before about the Google browser. Uh, like there's been, now it's quite famous, have a lot of students that have recreated the, the experiment to some extent and so on. But uh, uh, think about all the debate about the discrimination that Google algorithm provide when you search for specific um or, or you query it in a specific way yeah there has been a lot of debate about the fact that for years and in specific uh, um, uh, geographical context uh, based on your ip address if you were for example querying uh, google images for uh, black girls you will probably have had a way more pornographic content coming back to you with google saying it's not our fault this is how how, how the web see people but but you see all the bias that creates huh? that if you think that is a direct representation of a black girls, uh, it's, it's very problematic, it's very racist, it's very sexist, and so on and so forth. So all these steps of datafication are crucial, are important. And, and we live in worlds that are largely based on datafication. And so my point is not that we have to just say we do not datafy anymore. But we have to be very attentive to what and how we are data fine and what we take as our ground roots or our database. Okay, because this will have a huge consequence in cascade in how we represent the world and how we want to intervene on the world. And so interoperability is the second passage that kind of think, okay, we already have a lot of data. We have to have even more, collect even more, and work on more data because it's going to be better. And this is very problematic often. And this is happening not only in the just norm affairs domain, but also across various domain with the creation of the European Common Data Space. So this is something that is really happening now at European level. Huh? There is a data union information at the level of the area freedom, security, and justice, but there are many other data unions building up. And, and all deserve to be very attentive in the kind of Europe we are building. <clears throat> Database interoperability, in fact, is not something that is so recent. Huh? It's a, it's, and let me pedal back to some extent to the story of database. And I'm insisting it's database is really something that has characterized our modern statecraft. Right? We cannot think about the state the modern Western state without thinking about some form of datafication, and in particular, the creation of database. And again, like these are constrained also by technical competence, by means, and so on. So part of the reason why the principle of um, purpose limitation was successful was also because like building up bigger repository was like particularly challenging and many will be starting as a, a response to a specific need and so already in the late 80s early 90s the question of interoperability was raised across different domain was the idea to say like okay indeed we now have multiple database but maybe is the same official or is the same employee that has to go through so many databases? how can we make their life easier and so this idea to, to find a way to have a response to user needs for shared access across multiple autonomous databases was emerging already there. And when you talk with some computer scientists, they will tell you database interoperability is boring. We have solved it 30 years ago on paper. And, and yet I remember uh, having this conversation with a senior police official of a leading member states in terms of resources size and power if you want telling me like a uh, listen Rocco in fact uh, when I'm sitting next to database analysts most of their work is to cut and paste so to say information from one excel sheet to the other and they are doing it manually and they have to be careful that they are doing it the right column and so on so these people that are expected to be the elite of our intelligence to some extent are wasting time cutting pasting excel sheet i think that each of us has done it at some point in their life and you know how boring how difficult and how error prone this can be okay and there's requires a lot of work just to get the data into the same system so that they you can start to actually use data for processing operation so there's a lot of work required to make data interoperable 
if you see so. And this is an interview that I carried out in October 2018. It's already five years ago. It was just before the adoption of the interoperability regulation. But you see that there is a difference between the idea that is a problem that we have solved. Uh, many policymakers will sell you interoperability as something that is already there. And the fact that it takes dozens of years to set it up. <clears throat> and uh, here I want to connect back to the question of uh, algorithmic power. Uh, we, we have had a literature, we have had a lot of uh, societal debate in the last few years about algorithms. I think that the generalization of uh, platform services, uh, think about, uh, yeah, I assume that many of you probably have a Spotify account or use Spotify, probably you have a Netflix account or something like that. So you have became familiar on how an algorithm is expected to work, how it can profile you, how it can serve you services, how it can see you, uh, the, the debate about uh, uh, Meta, Facebook uh, application, Twitter, and so on. You have heard even like recently. So we have been accustomed with the idea that algorithms are, are a real power that we have to, to, to be careful about. Think about all debate about uh, riders, for example, and the gig economy and so on and so forth. But uh, when you read media theory and media studies, you remember that, that there's no algorithm without database and data structure. So to some extent, if you accept that computers are so important for our modern world, you have also to accept the vision that algorithm is only one way in which they see the world. The other way is database. Okay, so when you put together the fact that database remains so important for algorithms to work uh, and they cannot operate without some form of data structure, even when you want to move from discrete database to what they call big data, data structure are extremely important because algorithm needs to recognize the information they are inputted. Okay, it's not that you can just throw at the algorithm everything and they will crunch it. Huh? They have to pre-chew it for the algorithm to be important. And you also put into the picture the fact that there is no modern statecraft without some form of datafication and quantification. Yeah? Think about a state without tax. Huh? To have a proper tax system, you need some form of quantification uh, and datafication. Uh, when you when you see uh, you may be or not familiar with the work of uh, of Scott about seeing like a state like an interesting uh, passage of the book is about the build up of a tax system in French uh, construction of the modern state and without that if there is no France there is no centralized France because otherwise every single powerful man back in the days uh, will remain owner of how money has to be counted, uh, how property has to be counted, quantified, and how much taxes go back to the central uh, government. Uh, but so the central government has to fight back and to impose a standard across all the country to make sure that people actually pay the taxes that are expected to be paid. And why do you need taxes? Because you need to be able to pay for an army to make war externally or internally. Okay, so without these steps of quantification and the standardization of quantification, you do not have the modern state to some extent. Okay, so all of this to say like databases are in fact quite important. Uh, and there's been quite of a literature on that. You will you will hear more about that in in, in the next few days, you have already probably um, heard uh, from Matthias about state vision uh, and so on. But uh, what is interesting is to say that uh, there are at least three different uh, strands of research. Uh, on the one side, uh, EULO scholarship that has started to think about uh, the role of database and database interoperability in terms of obviously fundamental rights, but also of uh, quasi-constitutional setup and governance and the moment in which data protection is no more as important as it used to be or is redefined uh, the balance between different institutions changes too and we'll see it you will have some institutions that are way more powerful because they have way more access to information 
or they are the ones that are organized how other authorities will have access to information. Then you have a lot of uh, science technology studies research that think about, okay, the moment in which you have an IT system, there is a series of values that have been inscribed into it. Who can access what, at what, for what purpose, what are the um, constraints, uh, what is the overall values that organize it. But uh, the moment in which you reorganize the IT system, those values have to be reinscribed and there are maybe new values. And one values can be the fact that uh, before, if you are working in your unit, you want to keep your data in that unit because this is how you build up the knowledge and you position your own unit within a larger organization. And with interoperability, the new values may be that you have to share information, but uh, people may be resistant to that idea because they don't see what is their value understood as added value for them if they're just sharing the information with the other and they're no more able to share knowledge or to be the ones that are doing the analysis, for example, you see? And obviously everything that is about database interoperability and database is very much about how you cooperate across distance and difference. Huh? So you may ask, okay, uh, border authorities in Greece uh, upload information in the system, but then it may be Finnish border guards that uh, retrieve this information and that have to collaborate, but they may have a different uh, working culture. They may have different uh, local powers and so on and so forth. So how do you cooperate across this distance that is geographical, but also a series of institutional differences? Uh, and all these are the kind of questions that an STS approach to database interoperability will arise. And then within critical security and border studies, you will have a debate about state visions here. This idea that identification of individuals is a key component of uh, statecraft and what happens when this identification is carried out at European level or through European data rather than through a national system. But also what Georges and I call database anxieties. And it's this idea that if we follow this big data spirit that ultimately we already have a lot of data out there, we've accepted. We can also see that uh, this creates not only like an ambition to learn more out of those data, but also the feeling that uh, there may be things that uh, produce anxiety, that the threat is already out, inscribed in the data themselves. And so that we are not using enough the data, that we should use it in a different way, and that uh, some data may be more quality than others and so on and so forth. Uh, so a shift and anxiety that is not only produced by a word out there, but uh, by a word that is, has been already inscribed into the database themselves. And then the database and the reorganization became the main purpose of policy making. Okay, it's no more primarily of there is an external threat, there is a securitization out there, but there is a resecuritization of the database itself. If you see what I mean, okay, it's no more like a, uh, I'm, I'm oversimplifying migrants are a potential security threat, but is the information that we have in the visa information system and the Eurodac are where the threat is already described and we have to read carefully all that information to make sure that we can preempt the threat, okay? It's not something that we securitize out there, but we securitize an existing database to some extent. <clears throat> At the same time, as I was uh, uh, discussing uh, a bit earlier, database ever exist. Uh, um, so at the same time, they are so important for algorithmic power because there is no algorithmic power without database. And they are prone to data quality issues. They are inherently fragile. And so they are what we call the flickering foundation of European security integration. I think that none of you ever uh, worked uh, at the university or outside with a, a type machine, a typewriting machine, but uh, I, I, I still remember the first time I was using an early computer uh, and the early instances of, of Word. Uh, and when you compare them, on the one side, you will have um, 
like a lot of stuff that you have to 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 to, to rewrite that this idea that you cut and paste as a comment on your computer is the idea that before you were cutting <laughs> bits of paper and you were physically pasting on other um, bits of paper and then you will rewrite and everything so it was extremely time consuming uh, a lot of manual work uh, it was already more powerful than writing by hand to some extent because there was a way to store and to 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 transmit this information across the readers but still and think the revolution that uh, having a computer with word was uh, you were highlighting a sentence and you were moving 20 pages later and if you were not happy you can go back and this is extremely powerful imagine that uh, you are about to submit your phd thesis and a new information comes from uh, the secretariat and they now want all the phd thesis written in red i don't know or that you have to change the interline true Okay, if you had to write on the typewriter, you had to go to somebody to help you to change the color or to reformat everything. Huh? It will take you days. Now you can do within five seconds. Huh? And you will have a series of comments that give you that. So in this sense, this system is very powerful, but it may be also very easy to lose completely that. Huh? If you manipulate in the wrong way, you can erase your work. And if you have not backed up, and believe me, there are many students that do not back up their work. It's still quite possible. You will have erased all your work in the same amount of seconds. Okay, so this is what Catherine Hylas, a media theorist, says about the flickering. Yeah? It's at the same time extremely powerful, but it's so powerful that if an error gets into the system, it also resonates and cascades way more stronger. Okay, it's way more difficult to stop it. If there is a blackout, there is a blackout. Okay, if you do not have a redundant system, and this is what Schengen has, for example, Schengen exists in two different locations in Europe, in Strasbourg and in Austria, to make sure that if there is a blackout, one of the two is expected to still run. Okay, so you have to create a series of a system of a redundancy because you know that is very powerful, but extremely fragile at the same time. Okay, and this idea of fragility, we tend to forget it when we speak about uh, um european system so i, I will go a little bit uh, quicker a, a different way to focus on fragility is their inefficiency so um, um you you may know um yeah i will send you the, the, the bibliographic reference sorry i was reading the, the message you will um you will um, have heard maybe of the fact that uh, in 2022 in june the european Union Court of Justice uh, uh, judged about a case concerning the passenger record system and was uh, preparing for, for a conference and I read through the judgment and this is what the, the court says. In particular, as noted in essence by the Advocate General, the number of positive matches from automated processing of the PNR directive, which proved to be incorrect following individual review by non-automated means, is fairly substantial amounted in 2018 and 2019 to at least five out of six individuals identified. What does this say in practice is that when they are reviewing the impact of the largest mass surveillance system that we have ever set up in Europe, which is the passenger name record system, which is a system that obliged air carriers from all over the world to provide to national authorities several fields of information about each individual travel in advance and then during the flight amounting to millions of data about millions of person every year those data are going to be checked against system like the schengen information system but also against the um, pro risk profile huh? and they are saying like every time that there are six people that have been flagged as suspicious in fact only one is considered to be a real suspect and the real suspect doesn't mean that is actually suspect but is a real suspect based on the information available okay when you read the second part this is extracted from the european commission document about the review they say that the statistic gathered by the commission for 2019 indicates that zero point 59% of all passenger was that have been collected, have been identified through automated processing as requiring further examination, and even smaller fraction of 0.11% was transmitted to competent authorities. 
this means that out of those, like you have to process to control millions of data, millions of people for having only 0.59% that may be suspect. And out of them, like this uh, one out of six, uh, more or less, 0.11% that are actually confirmed as more reliable suspect that still have to be double checked. Okay, when you think about the, the scope of such a mass surveillance system, it's it's amazing. Right? It's it's a huge, huge, huge system right? because it's several times. So it means that your information, if you take a flight even within Europe for a specific route every five years, it means that your some data concerning you will stay with some authorities in Europe for counterterrorism and uh, uh, the fight against organized crime more or less forever till you keep flying yeah? because every time they can keep it up to five years uh, six months open and and four years now for pseudonymized but so th this is extremely extensive uh, when you think about the frequency of uh, offline of uh, your generation and my generation right now uh, even uh, even in the middle of the crisis uh, also because this is expected also to, to 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 be implemented for other means of transportation so even if you are taking a coach to go to a different place like it's enormous system okay and, and those are the figures so you can say like wow like wh why are we spending so much money are we discussing so much about the intrusion into and the infringement uh, encroachment into fundamental rights for a system that has such low score and yet so you can say like this is a very fragile system well, to some extent uh, it's unreliable and so on and still uh, let me uh, foreground like the PNR system remained powerful because <clears throat> The court itself sees that uh, these false positive are not so much of a problem because they confirm the fact that there is a human in the loop. There is somebody that has been able to revise all these uh, positive is and check up and see that actually five out of six are not real is. So the fact that we have identified that fragility and that uh, the overall system has a way to partially compensate for that fragility through human labor is a positive thing, which actually shows that is, among other things, a legitimate system, because it's respect this other principle of data protection, that is the fact that you will have a human in the loop before an adverse decision is going to be taken on you. And so to some extent, remember us in the fact that, uh, yes, the fragility is compensated by human labor, and this is good. Okay, and, and yet it creates other element. So they say to, to keep this uh, difficult balance between the fact that the system is really fucked up, pardon my French, and the fact that there is a lot of human works, like the solution will be to, according to some, to include more artificial intelligence, but no, because if you include more artificial intelligence, the human in the loop will be lost. Not only you won't be able to understand why you have been flagged, uh, because the decision in which um, the steps through which an artificial intelligence system will have flagged you rather than me is going to be obscure, but it's going to be obscure also to this human in the loop, so they cannot decide whether you are a false positive or not. And so, to some extent, the core rationale of the passenger name record system remain not in question, and so the algorithmic power that this system is, uh, it is the first system, in fact, that show the fact that uh, European Union has built an algorithmic power. The PNR has a specificity of being a system which is largely semi-automatized because there are so much data that are continuously being fed by private actors. And so these data have to be continuously checked against existing database, national and European, and against the predefined profiles. Okay, so this is really the first instance of algorithmic power in Europe. Uh, it's less known than other system because it was less discussed in the public press. It's very discussed in, in, in Europe and by institution, but it's really the first instance of that. So it has been multiplying and so on and so forth. And this was the occasion to turn it down. And yet the court resists the possibility to turn it down. 
And uh, maybe last slide, the interesting of this fragility is that this fragility is also recaptured by the commission saying that in fact, the fact that there are so many false positives is a positive sign. It shows the fact that uh, against the criticism about this mass surveillance rhetoric of the PNR, there is a targeting element in the measure. So only the people that are really checked several times will be sent for further inspection. So they use it as, as a way to say like, we are actually way more precise because it's only an infinitesimal fraction of the people that are going to go under secondary control. And yet uh, uh, we have not uh, enough resources to carry out this human labor, human intense labor. And so we have to change our approach and we have to promote a new uh, measure that has been uh, proposed in December 2022 to say like, PNR are commercial data, they are not verified. This is why they are very rich, but also not very reliable. So we need what we call advanced passenger information data, which are your passport data that are ready to be provided by um, air carrier and other carriers uh, when it comes to the border controls and um, migration management, but they now have to be they have been proposed to be also provided in case of counterterrorism and other forms of uh, security practice at European level, because this is a way to perfection the PNR and so to unload the work of uh, uh, passenger information unit staff, so to have less human labor in the loop, so that uh, the fragility here is presented as a way to further security legislation in Europe. So we have to ask even more data, more information, because this will make us even more targeted and more precise. So you see how the fragility of the system, in this case, does not bring into a fundamental question of uh, this surveillance system, but actually is used by two important actors in two slightly different direction that coincide on the fact that, okay, the system is good enough, but the good enough is okay, it can say like that on the side of the court. In the case of the commission, is we have to do even more. We need even more data if we want to be more precise. You see, so data calls more data. It's kind of a, of a eagerness for further data that never stops to some extent. And so one of the main questions right now is how can we put boundaries and how can we understand when data are enough, okay? Or is even this the right framework, the amount of data, or is the quality of the data or quality not only understood in terms of precision, but also quality for a specific purpose. Huh? So, so the, the overall purpose remains a big question mark. Why and for what we need all this data? What is the vision of Europe? And in terms of security, in terms of relation with our countries, in terms of relation with migrants and the seeker that we want to establish. For the moment, the, the emphasis is on getting more, ingesting more data, rather than rethinking the relation to them. And when we focus on the way in which we set up the relation to them, it remains indeed still a very securitizing one. And the idea that more data will provide us with the, more information about potential threats, forgetting the fact that uh, the way in which we inscribe this information in the database is in itself a source of anxiety. Uh, so to some extent, you can, you can focus on, and I think that it's very important to do that kind of research, focusing on how much uh, this database brings to the securitization of um, vulnerable people. But also it's important to see about how it becomes a separate debate about which kind of Europe we want to build. Okay, it seems that I've already loaded you with a lot of uh, information and now there's maybe more time to, um, to discuss. I know that we have a few minutes uh, if you have any question. Okay, thank you. 
Thank you very much, Rocco, for your very, very interesting presentation. Um, yes, we can have um, a, a round of, of questions, comments, remarks. We have uh, something like 10 minutes, something like that. So yeah, let's open the floor um, for any, any kind of questions, comments, observations you, you might have. Um, first of all, well, I, I would, um, there is a request in the chat um, from, from Tatiana. She's asking whether Rocco, you could please uh, share the biographical references, which you, you pointed out in, in, in your presentation. So that will be a first, uh, a first request for you. Um, any questions, comments, observations? Yes. Um, yeah, I, I see one one hand up uh, here in Zoom. Please go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Um, it was really interesting your talk, really. Um, and given the um, situation that we know even for migration, uh, even though it's, you said that it's not your expertise, I, I was uh, wondering, like, according to you, do, does there exist already a parameter? for the human in the loop, like uh, when you have an algorithm in place and, and you need to test it, like you said that for now, there, there is hope because um, uh, we tested the algorithm and the, the human found out some anomaly or, or, or at least they could um, uh, stop like an adverse uh, decision to be made. So is there a parameter that these many um, hmm tests have to be carried out for, for, for an algorithm that exists. Uh, I'm, I'm curious about that. It's a very good question. Um, in, in my opinion, the core does not establish a, a, a strong parameter. It just say, listen, if, uh, if um, five out of six uh, um, flags are recognized as a negative, uh, um, uh, like as, as a false positive, uh, this means that there is a meaningful engagement of the human in in the loop to some extent. Uh, I don't know if this is going to be turned into a standard uh, setting to some extent or not. Um, it very much depends on, uh, like if you extrapolate out of, of this case to in general, the assessment of, um, of, uh, of precision, the precision of, uh, of an algorithm is always situated in, in the scope um of of its uh, of its operation and uh, um how its um, um precision has been socially constructed uh for example uh, i was working a little bit on content moderation and i remember a few years back uh, uh, uh content moderation having a um, a false positive rate of 90% <laughs> Like imagine, like uh, it turn out, uh, like you go to the university, you fail nine of ten responses, you will never graduate, um, and that was uh, the con most considered the most performant algorithm because uh, there was nothing better, first of all, and second because they were able to sell it as still good uh, result in that specific context. So I will, I I do not have exact precise answer, but I will invite every time to think about uh, how this precision is constructed uh, and how the, mm, how do you say, um, the, 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 the role of the human is constructed as useful or not. Thank you. Yeah, because I, I was thinking from the perspective of uh, uh, EU AA, like uh, having more power over time to decide to take a call on the migrants applications and which member state should be the one deciding uh, the case and so the final decision that would be made uh, granting or not granting the asylum, if that's automated over time and, and the precision of it, that was um, my concern that uh, how many of the personnel they have to deploy to finally, I mean, keep a check on the, the automation side of it. Yeah, absolutely. It's a, it's a, there's somebody... Um... Jasper van der Kielst has now a non coin research project that is amazing about the use of uh, um, automated language identification uh, during uh, asylum uh, cases uh, processing. And it's, 
amazing, awful, <laughs> if you allow me to be a bit normative in this case, uh, case studies about the use of uh, uh, all this algorithmic support uh, in terms of uh, speeding up the procedure and uh, detaching also, if you want, the uh, assessment from the actual case and the actual person into a series of uh, markers that are, uh, in this case, expected to be not the biometric marker, so that have been so much criticized, but into social uh, cultural ones. Uh, and, and I'm thinking about the use of uh, uh, dialectal recognition and so that yes, that um, an algorithm uh, trained on a specific data set can tell you whether if you claim to be from uh, let me do my case uh, which is like a, I, I was born and raised in Bologna I come from a family from the south of Italy I, like, believe me that my accent in Italian is a quite of a riddle, but like, uh, will I claim to be from Bologna? Probably the algorithm will say no, because I do not have the typical accent from Bologna. And you can even, like, as the authority can even counter claim the fact that uh, he's faking the accent or is not able to even properly fake the accent because we are not judging Rocco and this uh, valid story, but uh, yeah, characteristic that if he was really born and raised in Bologna, he should have incorporated socially. So like a, and how you counter check this and so on it's going to be very interesting to see um and, and these are notoriously shitty algorithms uh, you know, for example whether they are going to be used way more to speed up the process so it's going to be quite uh, interesting to 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 study for example all right thank you um there is another uh question in the chat which is about the case law um, of the Court of Justice of the AU. Um, so from Anna, if you can mention the case number of the ruling you mentioned and whether there is uh, additional recent case law from, from the Court of Justice, some import, recent important rulings. Uh, compared to what I was saying, uh, I, I will include the, the, the case, but it was case uh, C817-19, uh, uh, Ligue des Droits Humains, um, but I will include in the slides uh, together with the bibliography so that uh, it's easier for you to, to, to browse um, at the PNR as a, as a series of cases um, before this one. Uh, um, a judgment uh, concerning the opening of the negotiation or the negotiation mandate with the Canada uh, Canadian Authority for a transatlantic PNR agreement with them. There is an old case of 2004, 2005, sorry, uh, concerning the EU US uh, passenger name record system. So there has been a series, there's been kind of a saga of cases concerning the passenger name record one. And on, on interoperability and what could be the most relevant case law, I will really recommend that uh, you ask this to Professor Vavola because she's really the expert uh, in, in the field. All right, thank you. Uh, questions, comments, observations, anyone? If, if not, well, it's it's eleven thirty, so it's perfect timing, and so I would just use this uh, last minute that we have to to thank Professor Rocco Bellanova for for his presentation and his participation. Thank you very much for for being with us today, and uh, look forward to to further collaboration and, and cooperation. So. Thank you, thank you very much, everyone. Let's now have a break of uh, 10 minutes, and then we will reconvene here with um, the second, uh, the second following session for for today. Right? See you, see you soon. Thank you for the invite. Thank you for thank being you. with me. Thank you very bye -bye. much. Bye. Enjoy the bye. rest of thank this you. amazing school. Thank you, Rocco. Thank you.
Ok. Eh, mentre, mentre tu io vado, mentre tu ti... Ok. Um, let's resume our, our, um, our session. And let's continue with the second session for today. Um, second session um, has, as, as, as professor, as guest professor today, Francesca, Francesca Palmiotto, is postdoctoral researcher at the Hertie School Center for Fundamental Rights. She's working at the project AFAR, Algorithmic Fairness for Asylum Seekers and Refugees, led by Professor Katrin Costello. Francesca is the co-founder and editor of the blog Digicon, the Digital Constitutionalist, and her research interests are focused on uh, law and technology with a specific focus on the procedural fairness of automated decisions and evidence. She obtained her PhD from the European University Institute with a thesis whose title is Artificial Intelligence and the Transformation of Criminal Trials, Preserving Fairness in Europe. Thank you very much, Francesca, for being with us today. And um, Francesca's topic for today is improving the asylum system, the role of artificial intelligence in international protection procedure. Thank you very much for, for your participation and the floor is yours. Thank you so much and welcome everybody on site and also online. I hope you, you can see me. We had some technical problems that were brilliantly solved by the team here. So thank you so much also for the invitation and for the cell organization of this amazing summer school. Today, I want to talk about the use of artificial intelligence in asylum procedures with a provocative question. Does AI improve the asylum system? And this is something that we will look into together. Usually I like to work with questions. We will also have some answers, let's say, but I think working with questions is a good way to reflect upon how artificial intelligence is actually um, um, uh, influencing, impacting this specific field. So some questions for today include how and why is AI used in asylum procedures? We will look into what is at stake for asylum seekers from a fundamental right perspective. We will look into what legal framework apply to AI in this specific context. We will also try to grasp a bit more how does it work in reality, in practice, with some concrete cases, in particular one. And finally, we will try to address together the provocative question, which is, do AI systems improve the asylum systems? And we will approach these questions. First of all, I will give you some of the findings from the AFAR project, which is the project I'm working on. Yesterday, um, uh, I think all of you attended the lecture by Deria. She's a good colleague of mine, and she brought this amazing stellar report, which was extremely hard to do because information on new technologies used by public governments are still very opaque. We still cannot grasp the whole reality. So her report is really a valuable source uh, for us studying this topic. So I will give you some of the findings from the AFAR project, but also my personal research within the project. We will look into a case study because I always think it's important to grasp a bit more the reality. So we will reason, we try to approach this question with a concrete case. We will have then a group discussion, trying to address some of the key questions and we will also use Slido. And now we do a quite uh, short technical uh, test just to see if uh, everybody can uh, um, is able to use it and can use it. Just, uh, I, I just want to say this because it's, uh, to me it's very important that when we approach the topic of AI in asylum procedures, today I will have a, quite a focus on EU law and the European context but I do not mean to have a Eurocentric perspective at all. I will try my best to address also other cases, but of course, since the upper project is highly focused on the European context, it will be slightly Eurocentric. Uh, but of course, this doesn't mean that uh, this is the best approach worldwide. Uh, okay.
Okay, let's just maybe try to 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 use the um, the slider. Why we'll uh, fix this um, technical problem? So, if you're all familiar with slider, it's very easy. You just go on slido.com and you enter the code. Can you, can you maybe put the code in the chat for the people online? So it's lido.com and the code is 5024519. So it's 5024519. So maybe people online can try to, to see if that works. Sorry, but what's this is a code for what site? Sorry? Where do we enter this code? So you just go on slido.com, slido. Can you, can you see the presentation now? People online? Yeah, okay. Yes, we can see it. Okay, then no problem. <laughs> now we'll show you the, the how to use slido. Can you still see it online, the presentation? Yes. No? Yes, okay, <laughs> thank you. Okay, let's try to use Slido one second. So you have the QR code or you go to slido.com and put in the code. There is no question now, we will use it later. But also for the Q&A, you can rather use Lido or the chat as you prefer. Is working? Yes, thank you so much. Okay, we will go back to that later. So let's start. First of all, how is AI used in asylum procedures? This is a picture I took from one of my favorite documentary. If you haven't watched it, I highly recommend it. It's called Coded Bias. I think you can also find it easily on YouTube or on Netflix. And it's the story of how facial recognition systems fail to um, identify correctly, especially people from, for example, black African communities. Um, and this is likely what happened in a case that has to do with asylum seekers. This is a study that was used by two asylum seekers to appeal their rejection of a claim. It's called Gender Shades, Intersectional Accuracy Disparities in Commercial Gender Classification. And the study found out that while they were evaluating free commercial gender classification systems using our data set and show that darker skinned females are the most misclassified group the error rate was up to 34.7 compared to the maximum error rate for lighter skinned males is 0.8. This report, this study was used by Ashan and Alia who were two refugees who were actually, they have been recognized as refugees in Canada. They were Somali citizens of origin uh, but after two years, since they were recognized as refugees, the uh, Canadian authority revocated their status on the basis of a facial recognition system. So what happened there was that they took their pictures, they put it inside this software, one of these software that were analyzing this study, and they found out, allegedly, that they were not from Somalia, but apparently they were from Kenya. So the fact that they lied about their identity, according to the public authorities, was a reason to believe that they were not credible. So they revocated their status. Of course, they appealed and they showed that facial recognition systems are very poorly accurate, especially when um, there are intersectionality elements, such as in this case. Um, and fortunately, then the judge um, um, uh, revocated the revocation of their status 
And so now, of course, they are uh, refugees in Canada, fortunately. But this is really a strong, powerful, exemplary case of what is happening and how AI is used in asylum procedures. Just to give a bit of more structure. So there are different ways. The first way in which AI is used is for identification of asylum seekers, like in the case I just mentioned, and determination of country of origin. And there are different types of systems that can be used for this purpose. We've seen facial recognition systems. There are also other biometric um, automated systems that can be used. Um, so generally biometric technology. We also have a peculiar case uh, in Europe that is the analysis of mobile phone data. How does that work? So basically in many different uh, countries in Europe, in particular in Germany, what they did was at the registration stage, they were asking the phone of asylum seekers they were registering. They were connecting the phone to a computer, to a software. They was basically taking the data, analyzing the data, and then creating a report. And this report basically would um, give a percentage, a probability. That... Okay. A probability that the person comes from a specific country. So for instance, in my case, I would be, I don't know, 70% Italian, 20% German, whatever. Okay, so it's like a probability of your country of origin. Um, and we will go back to this case uh, later. Another example also used in Germany is language recognition systems. We'll go, we'll come back to that later. Yes, yes. I will just, because I think it's just hard to manage the, the question. They cannot hear you online, I think. So. But if you, if you don't mind, there is lot, don't worry. There is lots of space for question, write them down and we will go back to that uh, later, okay? So I was saying also language recognition systems is another way. Again, at the registration, you are asked to speak for a couple of minutes and the system understands the language, but also the dialect with a certain percentage. So this is just a couple of examples. Then AI is potentially used. So these are cases, identification. This is happening in Europe at least. The other potential for AI in asylum procedures is a risk and vulnerability assessment. But this is just something that has been considered. There is a report by the European Commission where they said that this could have be a potential application of AI. For example, they will use sensory analysis of individual for granting special procedural guarantees, so vulnerability assessment, or AI to predict the risk of absconding during review and application and over application and return process. Another case is automated screening of similar asylum application. This is more like for internal management. If there are cases that are very similar, they could be dealt together, for example, by the administration. So this is more like an internal tool for uh, managing the workflow within the public administration. Finally, we also have matching technologies. This is for, let's say, a later stage. Um, it's not for refugee recognition, but at a later stage, once somebody has been recognized as a refugee, there is this idea of using matching technologies for their relocation uh, of refugees and also for asylum seekers. This is something I put in gray, but just because it does not directly relate to asylum procedures, stricto sensu. But of course, AI can also be used to provide reception services for integration and so on. And also, this is in a previous stage, forecasting tool to predict pattern, pattern of forced displacement, which is something that I think uh, was um, analyzed yesterday by my colleague. So another question is, we've seen how AI is used, but why? 
why do we need AI? What, is the, what, what are the benefits? What is the justification to introduce these tools? So government and EU institutions say, for example, this is the DG uh, Migration Home Affairs from the European Commission. They say, well, AI promises modernized migration, asylum and border controls through expedited and more efficient decision-making. But this is one of the rationale. Another idea, this is from the German BAMF. BAMF is the authority for um, internal affairs and migration. They said, well, origin countries do not accept reject rejected asylum seekers without reliable evidence. And that's why they use these systems to identify them. So the idea here is this system provides a reliable evidence for their identification. Again, from the German BAMF, another justification is, well, language biometrics further increase process efficiency without risking the loss of quality in asylum decisions. Let's try to read these justifications, having in mind what are their political priorities here. So first of all, from the new Pact on Migration and Asylum 2020, they highly, highly highlighted these key points. They want to build confidence through more effective procedures, faster asylum procedures, speed up the decision-making process. Another idea, this is actually very recent, it's from the Council Agreement on the Asylum Procedure Regulation that they reached just a couple of days ago, actually, in June, um, where they negotiated basically a position, a political position on the proposed asylum procedure regulation. And they said, we aim at quick and fast assessment in mandatory border procedure for asylum seekers. So this is what they have in mind. And of course, AI is great in theory to fulfill all of these promises because AI, promises to speed up decision-making, making things more efficient, smoothen the process while ensuring security, make better use of data. This is also something that we find often. We have a lot of data, we don't know what to do with it. AI can make the best use of it. And finally, provide reliable sources of information. So there's a lot of trust that is placed on technologies, they are reliable, they're efficient, they're fast, and they're cost-effective. This is at least the idea from their perspective. Sometimes it's also a matter of necessity. It's not just to make things more efficient. We need it, or at least this is another justification. I'll give you an example. It does not have to do with asylum procedures, but it's still, let's say, broadly in the broad sense in the field of migration and mobility, I would say. UK, Brexit, what do we do with all the people that are resident there, but they are not English? So they developed this EU settlement scheme where people basically could apply for a resident permit. And in only a couple of months since they opened the applications, the UK government received more than 7.2 million of applications. How do you deal with that? That's why they use automated systems. It's impossible to deal with it without automation. Or at least, again, this is not what I think. <laughs> this is what they say. Another necessity, let's say, uh, and this comes from Germany, is when they say, well, we do need to identify asylum seekers. And if they come without any documentation, how, how, how can we decide on their status? We need to know where they come from. Of course, country of origin information is super important in asylum decision-making. So we need to identify them. And when we cannot, well, we use their data on the phone where we use their voice. AI can help us in this. So these is our more or less the, uh, the ideas. Let's now take a critical perspective. So we've seen how AI is used, we've seen why. Let's see what are the risks. And of course, this, uh, I have only a couple of slides on this. It doesn't really mean to be at comprehensive at all because there are so many uh, different and complex issues. But just to give you 
of course, ascends. To me, there are technical issues of AI systems that create legal problems that we need to address. The first relates to the invasiveness. Of course, it's very different to provide your passport. It's providing your passport for identification is very different than giving my phone. The invasiveness is just completely different. Um, so of course, the invasiveness of this system poses risks and threats to the right to a private life. And I want to highlight here that it's not just about data protection, super important, but the right to privacy is much broader than that. It really protects the core of our uh, person, right? Our family, our life, our also dignity. Another technical problem that can have adverse consequences on fundamental rights is the issue of accuracy and validity of the system. Of course, if the software is inaccurate, like in the first case with the facial recognition software, that outcome will impact my rights. It's about discrimination. It's about having unfair decisions in the end. And it's not just about accuracy in a very technical sense. It's also about validity of the system. What is the method that the system uses to reach that output? I give you an example that does not relate to asylum procedure, stricto sensu, but probably you have heard of this eye border control, which was a project developed by, funded by the EU, where they aim at developing a software an emotion detection system. So it's something that basically you would take a video and from your face, allegedly, the system could infer your emotion and understand if you were lying. So scientifically, you cannot infer emotion from a face. This is scientifically proven that it's not possible. Why should AI do that? So, it's not just about accuracy, right? It's also about what is the scientific method that is, this system is based on? Is it valid? Can we use it for decision-making? Finally, of course, the big topic of AI, the use of biased data for training the system. Again, this, the, the, the example of the facial recognition system is exemplary in this sense, because these are systems that are trained on huge data sets that are not representative of all the diversities of human beings. And of course, this leads to huge risks for discrimination. And finally, this is something that I uh, had the pleasure to, to study a lot during my PhD, is the issue of opacity. What does this mean? Especially with AI systems that are increasingly complex, where there is the automotion of their own coding. So before we had you know, computer engineering, uh, engineers coding the system. Now we just give them data. This is of course very simplistic. Huh? If there would be a computer scientist in the room, <laughs> he or she would disagree, but in a very simplistic way, I think I think this is okay. Does this work? Yep. Yep. Works. No. Oh. <laughs> it's okay. Can can you can you hear me online? Yeah. Okay. Yes. Great. Okay. Fantastic. So, in a very simplistic way, opacity means that we don't have a clear understanding of what's going on inside the system, right? We have a clear understanding of what data we're using to feed the system, but how the system reaches the output, that's less clear, okay? There are ways to achieve transparency, explainability and so on, but this is more or less. And it's not just technical opacity I'm talking about here, it's also the complexity. Imagine a lawyer, who has to defend their clients or challenge the use of an AI system? We're lawyers, we have a legal background. How can we know, have this 
you know, technical understanding of the system in order to challenge it. So this is raising different problems, which of course, from a fundamental right perspective, impact the concept of fairness in its procedural dimension. How do I challenge the system? How can I pose to its use? How can I know how the system works, right? And of course, there are these technical issues which raise different legal and I would say also governance questions that scholars are aiming at addressing in different fields right now. So first of all, what is fairness in the AI era? era? Is AI changing our perception and conception of fairness? How can fundamental rights be implemented for AI? For instance, the right to challenge an AI system, how does that work? What does it mean? How can we translate these rights with regard to AI? Another question is how can, again, how can one challenge the use of an AI system? How do existing legal standards apply to AI? Do we need a new regulation? Do we need a specific approach? Do we need, or can we, for example, apply the rules that are already existing for example, in asylum decision making, how do we apply those law to AI? What is the difference and so on? So these are interesting questions. And here, I kind of, this is of course not um, extensive, you know, uh, it's, it's very brief, but just some scholars that are truly, um, that are working specifically on the use of new technologies in migration and asylum, um, for instance, Petra Morna, she's a great scholar. She's doing thrilling research, especially on Canada, for example. And she looks into international human rights law and migration and the use of new technologies. Then, of course, we will have uh, tomorrow um, uh, the honor, actually, to, to have a lesson by Nyobi Pavula, a very good friend of mine and colleague, and she's doing really terrific work especially on EU interoperable databases and how it affects the right to privacy and data protection of migrants. Then again, my colleague now, she's focusing on how asylum, uh, asylum seekers perceive fairness when new tech, new technologies are used. Um, uh, so it's a different angle, uh, but of course, extremely important. Um, then great work on discrimination and AI more broadly by Sandra, Sandra Wachter, Dimitri van der Mesche, especially in the context of migration. So I truly recommend the work. And of course, Matthias Lees. And finally, uh, automotion and the right to an effective remedy, thrilling work by the, uh, Simona Denkova. There is a book uh, which will be published in September on this specific topic. Mm -hmm. And Evelyn Brower, who is writing on this in many, many years. So really super interesting work. Okay, so now something a bit different. I want to give you, provoke you a bit with an example from my experience, uh, which I think can help us reflect on a key question today. So this is me a couple of weeks ago at the UI conference ceremony. As you can see me, I'm very unsmiling and got my PhD, super nice moment, super happy. My mom unfortunately could not attend in person and the whole ceremony was live streamed on YouTube. So she was at home watching me and it was actually really nice because she knows English, but sometimes it's a bit hard for her to follow. And she added the you know, automated caption in the video on YouTube. And she told me everything was fantastic. Like I could follow everything. It was so accurate, so detailed until the president of UI started to call our names, name and surname, okay, to take the the um, uh, the, the paper, the document, and uh, and so on. There, the system started to got it completely wrong. So my name is Francesca Palmiotto, and I became Francesca Pignata. All of the sudden, why am I telling you this? Because Google, YouTube, hmm? owned by Google, is they have the most advanced 
systems for language recognition. So what the system does is it was live streaming, it was not even recorded, right? It was live stream and they automatically generate captions. So what happened that the system got it very, like very accurate when they were talking and so on. But at some point it started to got all our surnames wrong, all of them, all of them. They were all wrong. And they do have the most advanced systems nowadays because of them, it's Google, it's YouTube, right? So the question I would like to pose to you and I invite you to reflect on is in this case, right? We are all laughing, it's Francesca Pignato or whatever, you know, like, okay, it's, it's nice, it's funny. Uh, I enjoyed the moment, I was there, nobody cares, right? It's not on a document that inaccurate surname. It had no impact on me. But the same system, so there was a language recognition system, right? But the same system, when used differently, it changes, right? It changes the impact it can have on a person. So let's take the language recognition system on the live stream on YouTube versus what's happening in Germany, a language recognition system to identify or to transliterate names, for example, right? And let's take another example, which I think is a more positive example, the use of language recognition system in Latvia, which is one of the few examples that we can mention where you really saw that AI was developed and designed to aid asylum seekers and mm -hmm. asylum seekers and migrants, because what they do in Latvia is that once you're a refugee or you're there for a certain amount of period, of course, you can apply for a citizenship and you need to pass a test, which is you need to sing the national anthem. Mm -hmm. So what they did, they developed this system to basically, so you can practice. So you're at home, you can practice to sing the national anthem and the software tells you how good you're doing. So this is something that you can do at home. It's for you, it's for your health. So again, recap, same system, language recognition system, YouTube live stream versus Germany for identific identification as asylum procedures versus Latvia for citizenship um, uh, to hating people in citizenship application, okay? And I ask you, of course, we know there is a difference, but what is it? Can you classify this system differently? Can we find a name or a term, a concept that allows us to clearly understand what is the difference? Is it about decision-making? Is it about, what is it about? And then we reflect, we, we reflect on it uh, later. So I invite you on Slido and I will give you maybe five minutes to answer the question. Just give me one second, I need to... Yep. Yeah, the poll is open, so you should be able to answer. It's all anonymous, so don't worry.
I see some heads up. You can see it right, but I start just to summarize a bit. Um, your thoughts, what is the difference? So of course, you're all right. And many of you said, well, it's about the scope. It's about the goal the system pursues or the authority using it to pursue. It's about the design. It's about the objective. Many of you, of course, also notice the difference between when we use something for decision making. So that's a whole set of rights that can be potentially affected by it. One of you, this is very interesting, uh, said, well, in the case of Germany, it provides evidence. And I couldn't agree more with this. So of course, the idea of automated decision making is extremely important. Um, and in EU law, at least, um, there is a definition, let's say, of automated decision making, which we find in the GDPR, which is very narrow. It says a decision is automated when there is no meaningful human involvement. So the moment there is a human, like a, a authority that basically an officer from the public uh, office authority that basically checks is out there, can basically reject the system's output. That's not an automated decision, which of course there are reasons why it's so narrow. But at the same time, this term doesn't really tells us much more about, for example, the case of Germany. And that's why I call it automated evidence, because that's what it's doing. Automated evidence, because it provides information, this information is added to the case file, because decision makers rely on it, because it provides special ground to identify individuals, or let's say replaces human experts, such as an interpreter or a linguistic expert. And why, why is it so important to understand and call them for what they really are? Well, because this impacts and allows us to understand what legal framework applies. So this is just an overview. I will not go through it, but in my recent um, a paper, uh, which um, I just finished, actually, I tried to give a taxonomy, an idea of when does it matter that automation is used in the decision-making process and how can we call it? So what standards apply? So if we conceive this as evidence, we do realize that it's not just about, of course, the GDPR, because it's based on data processing. You use data, personal data of asylum seekers. So of course, the GDPR applies, but also evidence rules. For example, you asylum law sets procedural rules and evidence rules. What evidence can be acquired by public authority, how it should be assessed. And forthcoming, if the system is AI, which in not, not all the cases it is actually, but if it is AI, then we will have a new layer of regulation, which will be the AI Act. So we really see these overlapping layers. But in my opinion, if we really try to understand in practice, what is the impact on fundamental rights? What is the system do it? Let's call it automated evidence, because this allows us to understand the specific problems and also to apply standards that we already have. And then we can you know, reflect on whether that's enough. So this multi-layer framework, we have data protection, we have the forthcoming AI Act, and then we have evidence rules. And what does this give us in terms of tools? So of course, from the data protection framework, we can take important provisions such as principles of data processing. Data processing must be fair, lawful, and transparent, super important. Rights for data subject, the data subject has the right to access their personal data. So I need to know what, what data did you use to generate their report from my phone? Maybe it's inaccurate and I have the right to correct that. Super important. Data protection impact assessment, also extremely important. And role of data protection authorities. From 
let's say, asylum law or also national law setting rules uh, for um, uh, asylum decision making, we can get, for example, the principle of individual assessment and cooperation between authorities and applicants. And from the I Act, this is a different approach. Mm? The I Act is not a type of regulation that is driven, driven by like the GDPR from to protect fundamental rights. It's an internal market regulation. It also has as objective the, um, uh, to ensure that AI systems do not threaten fundamental rights of individuals, but it's primarily an internal market regulation, which means that what they do, their approach is to conceive AI as a product. AI is a product and you, if you develop AI, you must certify the, that your system fulfills certain requirements, design requirements like data quality and so on. And then we have important provisions also in terms of transparency and the public database, which at least can give us information about what AI systems are used in different sectors that are extremely important. And of course, my question is, is it enough? Is all of this enough? Because in the specific case of asylum procedures, we know from scholars or refugee-related literature that outcomes are extremely discretionary in asylum decision-making, even before automotion. Is automotion going to make that worse, better? Who knows? Another point that we know, for example, from Noel and Evans Cameron is that a system like our um, asylum system, uh, decision-making system, is based on credibility assessment. Uh, and this is highly dysfunctional. Will this change with AI or not? Finally, um, Kinshin, for example, he claims that AI will benefit a refugee if it does not replicate the problems of the current system. So, you know, we've seen the problem with AI and we're using AI in a system that is already extremely problematic. Do we need a sector specific regulation where we use AI in this field or not? Interesting policy, legal governance question. So just a brief of a recap, how and why AI is used in asylum procedures. We've seen this concept of efficiency, of speed, of necessity sometimes. What is at stake for asylum seekers? Different impact on different fundamental rights. What legal framework applies? A multi-layered framework, not just a protection, not just AI regulation of coming, but this more like specific approach. So let's deal with AI with one regulation, but also of course, asylum law. Is it enough? Does actual AI actually improve efficiency, efficiency and is it really necessary? And I give you this case, which is the case of mobile phone data, which I know uh, there were some questions. So maybe I will try to address that as well. Your phone victim, so as I said, this was uh, a case in Germany where actually this was allowed by a law. So they introduced a law that allowed to take data, mobile phone data, when asylum seeker could not provide a valid passport, not other means of identification, a valid passport. So they were using this and in the law it said, well, but authorities can do that, can take the phone, only when no other less intrusive means are available, okay? The fact of what they were doing in the practice was that as a precaution, they were taking the data, okay? Just as a precaution. And then they were asking a special authority within the BAMF, um, special officers with certain expertise to allow them to use the report generated in the asylum uh, decision making, okay? So basically what was happening is I take your phone, take the data, and then I ask if I can use it, okay? And this of course was challenged because the idea of the law was different. The idea of the law was you take the phone data only when no other less intrusive means are available, not as a precaution and then you ask. That's the invasion. The invasion is taking my phone data. It's not just using it in the decision-making process, okay? So there was this case that fortunately went in front of the um, German Federal Administrative Court where the court said, well, no, 
this is a violation of the right to privacy uh, because you need to assess whether the measure is necessary before you take the data, not after. It's useless otherwise if you do it afterwards. So the decision in this case, um, because it was actually an asylum seeker from Afghanistan, and they rejected her asylum claim because the analysis of the mobile phone data said she's not from Afghanistan, even if she basically provided other documentation for her identification, such as a marriage, a marriage certificate. So they could just take that, and they didn't, okay? So of course, they annulled the decision, fortunately. So first question, was it necessary? Like, do we actually need it? In this case, no, there were other means. There are always other means to identify a person before taking the whole data from a mobile phone. And actually out of 16,000 analyzed mobile phones by the BAMF, this is in 2019, only 3,000 reports were requested. Following the request, the necess necessity of the measure was confirmed only in 2,000 cases. So it was not that necessary, actually. More reliable? The rep this is a report, actually, by the BAMF. So they explicitly say, we, from the mobile phone analysis, we had unusable finding in se almost 70% of the cases were unusable, inaccurate. They couldn't do anything with it. So more reliable? At least in this case, no. Finally, quicker. Did it make it quicker? Actually, with this law, they added procedural steps. So they had to take the phones, then they had to ask for an authorization. This takes time, especially in German public administration. Trust me, I live there and they are super slow. So it didn't even improve you know, the efficiency of the system. But still, they did it for many years. So now what I would like to do is to give you some time for a group discussion. This is a very provocative question. In light of all of this, is AI improving the asylum, asylum system? And I, of course, would like you not to just reply with a yes or no, but to elaborate a bit. Uh, don't aim too high. Maybe one concept is more than enough. And we can do a group discussion. So people online, we will uh, put you in breakout rooms. And here, don't move, now we, we, we separate you now to maybe two groups. And you will have 20 minutes. So we started a bit later, no? Is it okay? Okay. We will, I'll try to stick to one, but it's not my fault. We started a bit later today. Uh, so maybe, yeah, 20 minutes, 20 minutes, and then we, come together and uh, and we discuss that. Uh, again, it's all anonymous, so don't worry. Uh, you won't have to talk. I will then check what you write on Slido. So how I see it online, group discussion, here group discussion, and then you put maybe one sentence, one concept very clearly, very clear on Slido, okay? And then we come back and discuss. You need to help me with the, okay. They are in record room.
Hi, people online. Was everything okay? Did you use the slider was okay? Okay. We're just waiting one second for the people uh, here in presence to come back. The room was too small, so they had to go out. So just bear with me two minutes. Thank you. Okay, I think we can come back. Thank you for this. I'm seeing the, the answers on Slido and I will maybe just read a couple of them, which are all extremely interesting. Can people online hear me? Well, yes, okay, thank you. <laughs> Sorry for asking all the time, but. So many of you said, of course, it depends on the perspective. What is the perspective that we are taking? From a security perspective, maybe yes, but from the perspective of asylum seekers, it raises too many problems. Some of you said, I think it only helps the country of destination and on the asylum applicants. For government, maybe it helps. However, when speaking about people's rights, AI is not reliable or accurate. Other people said, maybe yes, but only if certain rules are followed. So we need stricter rules about how these systems are designed. Adequate algorithm training, effort to minimize bias and so on. And this is a bit, uh, let's say one of the aim of the AI Act. So something that could be interesting to uh, follow up on. And I know that you will be to also do um, a policy paper presentation today. So I hope that this gave you some food for thoughts also for understanding and analyzing the AI Act from this perspective. Um, 
Another interesting answer uh, is, well, yes, it could improve the speedness of the procedure, but maybe not the quality as they claim. Depending on the aim of the AI system, it could improve the credibility assessment, proposing automating questions in order to deepen certain aspects. At this stage, it's really difficult to say that the efficiency, efficiency has been improved per se. In time with better structure and rules around the use of AI system, uh, in the asylum system will be able to answer that. So many of the group discussions were a lot about we need to regulate AI, we need to understand the rules for AI. So this is, let's say, one side of the coin. The other side of the coin of your group discussion that is also extremely interesting is, well, but we need also to reform asylum decision making, asylum law, that's a highly dysfunctional system, and we cannot just add and add and add other problems, other problems on something that is already problematic. So the other side of the coin is to say, let's refocus on asylum systems. Um, other people were very strict, uh, straightforward in saying, no, AI contains biases and um, it also has um, potential risks for decision making. So I guess the conclusion is that there are ways in which AI can be used and when it has to deal with decision making, we should be extremely careful. So we need a normative approach. It's not just law. It's really, you know, to say when and how, it's not even how, sorry, it's when AI can be used or should be used. So that's more like a normative philosophical question that we also need to address. Um, and then there are middle grounds like, yeah, we can say yes, we need to pay attention of AI because it has the potential to improve the asylum system by assisting with tasks. Uh, such as data management, management, it can help streamline processes and increase efficiency. However, it should be implemented carefully, ensuring transparency, fairness, and respect for fundamental rights. It was also some another very interesting answer, which I really like, and I will follow up on this now. Asylum systems. Asylum system is created to protect the people who are seeking asylum in the EU territory and not to allow people who can be threatened for you to enter their borders. So again, a perspective. What is, how can we use AI for who? For whose sake are we using AI here? For governments or for asylum seekers and refugees? So these were your wonderful thoughts and I really, really thank you for this. Um, it's also extremely helpful for me because these are super, hard questions and we may not find answers sometimes. I think also from the group discussion, we just added other questions, but I think this is even more important uh, than just having, you know, an easy solution at hand. My thoughts are from a normative standpoint, for me, technologies must benefit people. Efficiency is not a goal in itself. And the values of procedural fairness include the possibility to have a say. I need to have a say if I'm an individual whose rights are at stake. And this is also important to delimit discretionary power, especially when it comes from state, from public authorities. Therefore, from this normative standpoint, at least my conclusion could be, or some proposals, we should consider procedural fairness as participation, including the right to rebut AI systems output. I must have the possibility to say this is wrong. As well as, of course, very naive, but the right to be, uh, uh, the right to be presumed credible for asylum seekers. This is also something that AI systems are having a snowballing effect, effect because the inaccuracy of the system or whatever, like when AI systems are used, there is this idea that, well, you know, you're not credible, no? And this is something that I used to prove that you're not credible. And this is something that does not so much relate to AI, but to a deeply dysfunctional system already. Also, we should stop thinking that AI systems are reliable, always. We should instead change perspective and think 
that they are unreliable and team presumed liable, unreliable. And finally, of course, the role of transparency, which is much deeper here, is transparency as a possibility to understand and know how the system works. Finally, I think we should solve the trade-off between fairness and efficiency in favor of asylum seekers. For example, automate what? Let's imagine two speeding procedure. We can use automated tool when we have a positive decision, that's fine, it's positive. But when it's not 100% manifestly funded, then we need reflection, we need time, we need humans to take the decision. So in that sense, I think automotion, a good way to conceive automotion in asylum decision-making is to say, this is manifestly funded in two days, you are granted uh, the status of refugees. That would be, I think, um, uh, extremely important. And that's where efficiency would play a role, in my opinion. Finally, of course, we should also think about effectively enforce what we have. We talked about the role of data protection, but in practice, legal scholars who are doing legal empirical work are showing that data protection in practice is not effectively enforced. Data protection authorities do not have sufficient resources to deal with all the cases. There is a backlog of cases, time, it's super, it, it takes so much time when you complain to a data protection authorities. So maybe we should try to enforce what we have already, data protection role, strengthen the role of data protection authorities, not only against Facebook, against ChatGPT, but in the field of asylum, where data are taken all the time. And also, of course, training for practitioners. This is extremely important. We need training for practitioners in asylum law to also be able to address these challenges, be expert on data protection. This is increasingly important. And in the future, they will also have, I think, be, ex be at least familiar and expert with the AI Act, which will play an important role. So there are different levels. So just to conclude, improving the asylum system, my view is that AI is one more reason to rethink about how we can improve the asylum system. So this is, of course, a very open question, and this is my project, the project I'm working on, led by Professor Catherine Costello, Umeteria, there are other colleagues from different universities, including EUI in Copenhagen. And we are really trying to approach these questions from different perspectives, not just law, uh, but also social legal work. Uh, we're looking into the perception of asylum seekers, refugees, and migrants. We're looking into how we can use, for example, computational models to kind of nudge human decision makers um, to uh, highlight when their decision can be biased. So a tool that can help them to kind of be aware of the biases that they can have when deciding. So there are different ways, and we are trying to approach this. So I invite you to just uh, follow uh, our work. Um, uh, we have a website. I will send you all the resources if you are interested. And I would really like to thank you so much for the group discussion, for the slide, for your amazing reflections, and of course, the organizing committee <laughs> for inviting me today. So yeah, sorry, five minutes late. Uh, I hope we have some time, uh, but no, we don't, I don't know for questions and then, yeah, maybe I will send you the slides, but you can also take a picture. This is just a list of suggested readings if you enjoy the topic. Thank you. If you have some questions, you can raise your hand. Hello, hi. Um, really, thank you for this presentation. It has been a uh, true food for thought, as you were saying before. Uh, I have many questions, but I will just focus on um, on one, and maybe I will catch up later uh, if it's possible. Um, I was wondering if also the aspect about uh, the right to have um, an effective uh, remedy um, against decisions taken uh, on the basis of uh, 
um, results um, of uh, AI tools uh, is also being investigated by your uh, team. Um, I was thinking about the case of Germany, actually. Uh, we see that actually the statistics uh, they are mentioning are um, openly saying that is not really uh, useful uh, what they are doing, but what about uh, other cases where uh, do legals, uh, do uh, lawyers uh, ch are, um, are challenging this kind of uh, uh, aspects of the procedure? Um, thank you. Thank you so, so much. Of course, just for everybody, I'm sorry, we won't have much time for questions, but uh, you can have my email and just send me reflections, questions, I will follow up with uh, each one of you. Uh, thank you so much for the question. That's, of course, key. And the Alpha project is focusing on this. Actually, this summer, my summer will be dedicated to writing a paper on this. Uh, it's an extremely hard topic because you really see different remedies. Uh, right, like from a legal perspective, um, what I've seen so far in the cases is that most of the time there is an NGO involved. So the, because they have, you know, resources and legal expertise. Uh, so all the cases we're aware of, and also from Daria's report, for example, the information we got are most of the time because an NGO challenged a tool and it got public and mediatic attention. So here we have a problem of training no? for lawyers, because in theory, I think remedies are available to some extent that we will need to assess whether that's enough. But of course, in the case of German mobile phones, they did administrative proceed. This was an administrative proceeding against the decision, but they also did a complaint with the data protection authority, and that's still pending. So we will also see what will happen that they also kind of nudged the judge to refer to the court of justice to reply to some questions in terms of interpretation and GDPR. Mm -hmm. So there are really, you know, different layers. The German court, of course, within their competence, they analyze the case through the lens of administrative law, German administrative law. And they also said, well, we already solved the case because, you know, the bump was clearly in violation of the law. So we don't continue. We don't look into whether, you know, the GDPR has been violated by the law, we, you know, because they have this system, right? So there are different lenses. We have administrative law, then we have EU law, <laughs> then we have data protection, the data protection authorities, really like, and this, in my opinion, even increases more the complexity. So. We have a lot of remedies, and but how do we deal, like how do they intersect, right? So this is something that I'm, I'm trying to look into, um, but it's, uh, I mean, more research is needed. So <laughs> please, everybody's welcome, <laughs> because it's, uh, it also depends, you know, on the, there are different member states, different things. It's very complex and uh, to talk about, you know, the black box and opacity, that's also a legal black, black box to some extent. Thank you. Yes. Okay, my interest to others from area of freedom and security and justice for the local league. Uh, while we are making a presentation, one of our colleagues asked if the data subject have to give consent to the data collection. So my question is, what is the definition of where I can spoke to the data Yeah. 
sorry, Magister, will you summarize the question? Because I'm only can know the theory. Yes, so tell me if I understood correctly. The idea is when uh, data processing is by you authorities. Well, well uh, tell me again the question, sorry. So, I no, 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 because it's just hard to summarize. I know, I got what you what you said. I, I don't want to misinterpret. So what is the role of the data controller in relation to the data subject? Yes. What's the Yeah. 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 Yes. Yes. Okay. So the idea is that, so the question summarized is. What is the role of the data controller in relation to the data subject? What are the efforts from the data controller to actually make sure that the person gives consent and is informed about their rights? What is the role of the data controller? In other words, to include and enforce the rights or make possible to enforce the rights of the data subject in case um, uh, people on the move, let's say. Okay, okay, right. So again, <laughs> to come back to the legal complexity, if you from a legal perspective, I give you two, two perspectives, okay? From a doctrinal legal point of view, data controls have obligation, but they also, this idea of consent in data protection, especially in the GDPR, and in some cases as well in the law enforcement directive, which we think, you know, it's about criminal law, but research, for example, Teresa Quintel, she made an amazing book about how data protection in the field of Migration, uh, broadly speaking, is ex creates a lot of problems because the GDPR and the law, sometimes they apply the law enforcement directive because of this criminalization of people on the move. Okay, so and then we have lower standards, so it creates a, a, a gap in protection. Okay, so we have these problems, but also um, in the law enforcement directive, but also in the GDPR, the legal basis for data processing is not always consent. So in the case of the German mobile phone data analysis, for example, the legal basis was public interest. So they can also use, they have tools, hmm? they have legal instruments they can use. To be honest, from my research on the case, I don't deal so much with EU law, strict, like EU institutions, let's say, and how they use data. You will have Niobi tomorrow who can tell you more about this. So please do ask this question to her as well. But national authorities, I think they have no clue about the GDPR. <laughs> and it's honestly, uh, this is like, yeah, it's there, you know, it's a bureaucratic thing. And actually what is even uh, more worrisome is that sometimes the GDPR is used against migrants and asylum seekers as a tool to basically not allow them to access their data, which is, a, it's paradoxical, okay? So we have reported cases in Greece, for example, where public authorities say to the representatives of asylum seekers, I cannot send you the case, the, the file by mail, because digital data is, no, the security GDPR does not allow us to do that. You have to come in person, or I send it to you by mail. Send it to you by mail in the Greek islands means three months. And the deadline to appeal is 15 days. So just to give an idea, you know, GDPR is also used, let's say, to create even more barriers for asylum seekers and refugees, okay? So GDPR is not just, in my opinion, a legal tool, it's a culture that we need to embrace. It's a, the culture and the idea that the data subject is at the center, right? And from my, let's say, empirical work, I don't see that happening. But in the law, you know, the text in the book says that the data controller has all of these obligations. The GDPR in that sense is great. It's a problem of enforcement in practice. So we need empirical work <laughs> on this. If you're all interested, that's another idea.
Yes. Yes, it's Mimi. Hi. Hi, hello. Hi. Just one remark. I have a question mainly, but one remark because I, I worked as a lawyer in Athens with refugees. The, the deadline for the appeal starts to count from the moment that we receive the decision, even if it's by mail. So at least this. Okay. <laughs> this for the record, because you have to actually receive and sign, and then you have 15 days from that date on. But what was impressive was that Although in the islands, it's exactly like you said, they had to send it by post and you had to wait, especially if the lawyer and the asylum seeker was in Athens, yeah. it might take months, which in any case is not good. You might still have the right to, to an appeal, but still, I mean, it's a tool used for oppression. But in Athens, they sent everything by email, which is great, everything, recordings. GDPR was completely like inexistent to them for some reason. So it's, it's a further proof that this used as a tool, if you see, to uh, different approaches, that different approaches on the same country, in the same country. Yeah, exactly. But my question was not, that was just a note since you mentioned. No, no, no thank you for saying that. <laughs> You're welcome. My question was about Article 83. We've been working on this at the at the breakout rooms as well. And I was wondering, I, I have read Article th uh, 83 of the proposed AI Act, and it says that large scale IT systems are exempted. So we have like, I imagine, VC, Eurodac, ATS possibly, etc. And I was wondering, does it also apply to like smaller tools if they are 100% AI tools that will be used only for uh, for asylum um, decision making uh, reasons, yeah. let's say? Yeah, so the study of the AI Act is also super interesting and Article 83 has been really at the center of attention by scholars and by NGOs because there is this huge exemption so all the AI system that will be used in interoperable databases will be exempted if, well, it's a small if, but I like, I, I think it's important to add, if the systems are basically implemented before the AI Act enters into force, okay? So after, if they add a new system, they need to fulfill the AI Act. Before, no. And this is something that the European Commission made because they are constantly postponing uh, these databases, for example, ATS to become operational, and they don't want further delays. This is a very stupid justification we can discuss, but this is it, okay? They don't want further delays because, of course, if they have to fulfill all the requirements of the AI Act, it will take a long time, okay? So this is the idea. Article 83 does not apply to the systems I mentioned today. We don't know, however, where the AI Act is going towards because the original proposal was very clear. AI systems used in migration and asylum with a list are high risk, full stop. Now what they're doing, so the council did a mess and basically I, I'm doing a, actually another research on this because I, uh, I want to understand who is pushing for lowering the standards, because at some point we had a version of the AI Act that was horrible for uh, the field of asylum and criminal justice. Uh, super, huge exception to transparency, lowering standards everywhere. It was absolutely terrible, horrible. So, and it was when the AI Act was in the council because member states pushed for it. Member states wanted more exceptions in the field of asylum and migration because of security concerns, because no transparency is too much. No, it's about national security and all of these justifications. So now it's in the parliament and actually it looks like a better version. We will see what will happen. But generally I would say, yes, all of these systems are high risk in asylum decision-making, which is good. Now the parliament said, okay, we have the list in the annex, right? We all the system, but they also need to, um, to fulfill the classification high risk. They must pose a risk to fundamental rights or to safety or to health. So there is this extra assessment that you must do, mm? which can be seen from, you know, could, have, could be good, but could also be bad because before it was very clear, you know, there is a list, stop 
it doesn't matter what risk it poses, it's, you know, it's in the list. Now you need this assessment in concreto of the tool. And that's why I believe that the work we did today, when we, you know, were reasoning about the differences, how can we call them? Is automated decision making? Is it evidence? Is it what is it? I think it's important also to inform a fundamental rights analysis in terms of risk assessment. So, uh, but we will see what will happen with the IX. Yes, just want to say again, maybe I can also put my email in the chat. Uh, so if you, have, if you have fresh questions now, then you forget about it. Just drop me an email. I would like to, you know, follow up on that and get also to know your work and your, your interest there. So please drop me an email. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. Last